Your instructor is Jean Donaldson. Ms. Donaldson is the founder and principal instructor of the Academy for Dog Trainers, which has trained and certified more than 700 trainers in evidence-based dog behavior, training, and private behavior counseling since 1999. She also founded the Montreal Flyball Association and Renaissance Dog Training. Ms. Donaldson is a four-time winner of the Dog Riders Association of America's Maxwell Medallion, and her books include Train Your Dog Like a Pro, Dogs Are From Neptune, and Fight, A Practical Guide to the Treatment of Dog-Dog Aggression. Welcome. Have you ever dreamed of having your dog respond quickly and enthusiastically when you ask him to do something? You can absolutely have that. In this course, I'm going to teach you to train your dog so that he's a more enjoyable companion. We'll train all the bread and butter obedience behaviors, such as sit, stay, and come when called. We'll learn some tricks, and we'll also troubleshoot common behavior problems. And there'll be in-depth, accurate information to help you understand your dog better. Training will also improve your dog's life. His access to the human world depends on his manners. Not only that, training is environmental enrichment for dogs. Zoos, quite rightly, get flack for the sometimes impoverished lives of their charges. So the good ones pour energy into making animals work for their food. We could take a page from their book, and training is one way to do so. Teaching dogs to do things is mentally stimulating and tiring, gives them a sense of control over their environment, and is therefore good for their behavioral wellness. Your dog doesn't have to be a particular age, breed, or size. We're going to be training using operating procedures that have been vetted on thousands of dogs of all types. Demographic factors, such as age, breed, and size, can present constraints, and we'll deal with these when they come up. But, by and large, good training technique will be very effective on a huge population of dogs. So will this course be about first principles, or recipes, or both? The answer is both. You will come away with sufficient knowledge of the first principles of how dogs learn and how best to train them that you'll be equipped to train and troubleshoot on your own. These first two lectures are exactly that. But we also have detailed field-tested training plans for those bread-and-butter behaviors, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The majority of this course is going to be what trainers call training behaviors in. Installing, sit, down, stay, wait, don't touch, come when called, walk on leash without pulling. But later on, we're also going to talk about training behaviors out, disinstalling unwanted behavior, such as chewing the wrong stuff, eliminating in the wrong place, and excessive barking. Because you're a primate, we're going to exploit your ability to learn via observation. There will be lots of detailed demonstration. I'm going to show you everything. How animals learn is one of the most studied phenomena in the history of psychology. How to apply this science out of the lab in the messy real world is also well understood. But, as you've probably experienced yourself, there's a lot of folk knowledge about dogs and dog training. We're bombarded by tips and advice from internet gurus, entertainers on TV, and family and friends. And the problem is this. What we're hearing is, by and large, not very accurate. One of my goals for this course is to demystify dog training. I'm going to share with you evidence-based principles and practices. In today's lecture, we're going to lay some foundation. I'm going to introduce you to three core principles of dog training, which will be woven throughout all the practica in this course. So let's get started. There are three key principles of dog training, and they are these. First and foremost, there is no free lunch in dog training. This principle is all about motivation. You're going to have to motivate your dog, and not with magical energy or a cult of personality, but concretely. All successful dog trainers motivate dogs concretely. They're just not all very transparent about it. 
We, on the other hand, are going to be very transparent. Second, the dog has to feel safe. If he's worried or afraid, this is going to trump everything else, and training will go nowhere. So we must be competent at recognizing and addressing fear. Third, training is a step-by-step -step process. It's a gradual building of behaviors. There is no knowing. No dog knows sit, or stay, or come here. And importantly, there's no knowing followed by willful disobedience. There are just shades of gray of level of difficulty, and shades of gray of probability of the behavior happening when we want it to. The craftier you are at leveraging these three principles, the faster and more effectively you'll get the job done. So now, let's dig into each of them in more detail. Principle one is our no-free lunch. All behavior has cost, and there must be offsetting benefit. This is a fundamental principle of evolution. Animals that behave willy-nilly in animal training, we call it wasting your behavioral dollars, are outperformed on the evolutionary playing field. Domestication has not altered this bedrock fact in dogs, in spite of what you may have heard about dogs having an inherent desire to please. If your dog sits when you want him to, it is entirely because he has some history of the carrot, the stick, or both. Let me tell you about a client whose epiphany on this subject turned her relationship with her dog around. A woman called me about her labradoodle, Valentino, who was running amok. He jumped on everybody, and at the park it took her 20 minutes to collect him because he wouldn't come when called. Valentino even played keep away if she went after him. Then one day, he bolted out the front door, ran down the street, wouldn't come when called, and was nearly hit by a car. This was the last straw, and she called for help. When we met, I asked her if Valentino had ever been trained, and he had. He'd been taught sit, stay, and a recall, all of which would be perfect choices to address her problems. But Valentino wouldn't do any of these behaviors when it counted. In fact, he would barely do them at all. And the reason was very simple. He was never paid. And he was never paid because his owner felt entitled to his obedience. She expected obedience without what many of us consider bribery. She wanted free lunch. Valentino had been trained in a way that was very common, but also very ineffective. There had been motivation at the beginning. The way it was framed was that food should be used to teach the behavior, but that once the behavior was, quote, learned, his owner's praise would be enough. Food or other motivation was no longer necessary. She could just command, sit or stay or come here, and Valentino would do it because he knew what to do and wanted her happy. Now, let's talk brass tacks. In the jargon of animal training, Valentino's vital behaviors were on what we call an extinction schedule. An extinction schedule means when the animal does behavior X, he is not paid. And the more times he does the behavior without payment, the less and less reliable that behavior becomes. The behavior is quite literally moving towards extinction. This type of training is one of the ways the pros get rid of unwanted behavior. Think about that. The very behaviors she most needed were on a regime that professional animal trainers use as a dedicated strategy to kill behavior. This well-meaning owner's critical error was conflating what Valentino was supposed to do with why he should do it. Trainers call this the what-why distinction. Remember that food that was used for the first bunch of repetitions? In spite of the teaching explanation, that food wasn't merely instructional. It was his paycheck. And when the pay stopped, so did his behavior. As predictably as apples falling down when you drop them, his sitting and staying and coming when called all died. When Valentino stopped performing, his owner understandably got upset. From her perspective, he clearly, quote, knew because he, she had witnessed his obedience in those early reps. So when he stopped obeying, she couldn't help but invoke the trilogy, stubborn, willful, and dominant. 
But Valentino wasn't any of those things. His behavior was just being governed by lawful principles. What really helped her was coming to understand that extinction is nothing personal. It's just the law, like gravity. So what did we do? We instituted paychecks, and Valentino's behavior fell into line. Now, the paycheck analogy is useful, but there are important caveats to the parallels between your motivations and those of your dog. We are all susceptible to laws governing reward and punishment, but you have motivations that your dog does not. This might seem obvious, but it turns out to be very important. Let me explain. You probably do all kinds of things that don't pay you immediately, directly, or tangibly. You throw behavioral dollars at achieving a sense of accomplishment or maintaining your health in the future. You contribute to the common good, and you perform work to make others happy. You do all this without concrete or immediate compensation. Your dog does not, and he will not. He needs immediate, concrete compensation for most of the things you want him to do. He doesn't think stay and coming when called are inherently valuable. To him, they're actually kind of dumb. They even interfere with goals he thinks are inherently valuable, like staying at the park, chasing a cat down the street, or licking your face when you come home. So where is their overlap between you and your dog? Well, even though you might have human-specific motivations like philanthropy, like your dog, you wouldn't crank out copious behavior you think is intrinsically dumb. You wouldn't leap to your feet and paint your living room if it didn't need it. You wouldn't spend $300 on tickets to a play you hated, or suddenly sit motionless on the sidewalk on your way to the 7-Eleven. And even if you like your job, if your employer said, no more paychecks, from now on, praise from your supervisor is good enough, you probably would stop going to work. But back to dogs. They require immediate positive reinforcement. Make no mistake, the only alternative to positive reinforcement is a protection racket. If he doesn't do it, you hurt or scare him. Luckily, you don't have to resort to that. We have plenty of tools to accomplish all our training goals without any threats or violence. If you're interested in the relevant research on training methods, you'll find these referenced in the guidebook. Now, I said dogs find most of the stuff we want them to do inherently dumb, and so they need extrinsic motivation, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that. Some dogs are bred to want to do certain things. For example, Border Collies and many lines of sporting dog find retrieving inherently enjoyable. I'd even dare say that some of these guys are so fetch mad it borders on a compulsion. They will retrieve without being rewarded for doing so. If we happen to want them to retrieve, it can look like a violation of the no free lunch principle. But in that case, it's a happy alignment of what the dog wants to do in the first place with what we find useful. Most dogs must be paid to do what we want. If you have a dog, you can put the no free lunch principle into effect starting right now. Let's talk motivators. Let's talk paychecks. I don't know your dog, but I'm willing to bet everything I own, no kidding, that if he's a healthy dog, he is motivated by food. So you have one guaranteed weapon right off the bat. Let's go over the food rewards and other gear you'll be using in this program. Here are some go-to types of food reinforcement. First, commercial dog treats. These are primal nibs and robble bits. I like them because they have short lists of whole ingredients. They're also really small, but really tasty, which means they'll go down fast and I got lots of bang for buck. You'll see Lulu and Moxie, both large dogs, work very hard for these tiny pieces. Audition treats to see what your dog most values. While you're doing bait prep, if you use non-commercial treats, your dog might very well be lining up and hoping that you're going to give him some. One way you can keep him busy is take just a few of these, or even some of his breakfast if you give him kibble, and put them into this. This is called a snuffle mat. 
This is something which can hold a huge variety of treats at different levels. You can basically just insert them in here. And what happens is you put it down and your dog has to use his sense of smell to find them and eat them. Really nice enrichment option. And we're gonna be talking a lot more about enrichment later on in this program. Next up are Diced Chicken Breast and Pecorino Romano. So what's the deal with, quote, people food for dogs? Have you ever noticed how dog food manufacturers market their products to you? By emphasizing how much chicken or beef or other whole ingredients it has. You'll see TV commercials with chicken and beef chunks raining down. These things are safe for dogs. And importantly for us, the dog really values them. He'll work for them. And once again, he'll work for tiny pieces. This is Pecorino Romano, and an appropriate size of food treat for even a large dog would be as small as that. It's really potent. For diced chicken, an appropriate size, you would dice it, would be something like this. Very small little shred. Because it's so tasty, you don't need to use a lot. Here I have what's called Slam and Sammy's, and this is a mixture of dehydrated chicken with banana. If you have difficulty getting fruits or vegetables into your dog, here's one way you can get a little bit in. Okay, let's talk about gear. These are bait bags. They're kind of little pouches that hold dog treats. I'm a bit of a clean freak, and so I always line my bait bag with a plastic baggie, a sandwich bag or something, but you don't necessarily have to because most commercial bait bags are washable. So for instance, this one, it's called a treat and train. You can put it right in the wash. It's also got extra little pockets for poop bags or for anything else that you might wanna bring along. You can use both pockets in case you wanna have two different levels of treat. One for simple cheap behaviors and one for something that's a little bit more expensive for the dog. This is a fanny pack. I'm a little bit old school, um, and so I tend to use a fanny pack. You can use anything at all that is comfortable that you like to wear, and that keeps your hands free. You can also put bait right in your pockets or into a plastic bag and then into your pockets, uh, and that way you don't have the visual to the dog of the bait bag. But when you're in early training and you're doing lots and lots of repetitions in the initial installation of behavior, the volume of treats usually dictates that you're going to want to have some sort of storage. Now, if you're training indoors, I have often with my dog just put stuff in a bowl or in a plastic bag and not had it on my person, and that's fine too, as long as a eventually down the road, you get to the point where those things are out of the picture so that you have a dog that will perform without seeing those cues up front. We're going to be training off leash because it gives us the best read on how the dog is doing and keeps both our hands free. The one exception is when we work on pulling on leash. When I first started in training, the options for pulling on leash were exclusively pain-based, choke and prong collars. They're still legal, at least in the U.S. The use of pain as motivation carries side effects, is ethically less defensible, and just not necessary. There are now anti-pull harnesses, such as this. What it does is it changes the point of contact from the dog's neck or chest or back and puts it in front. What it does is when the dog attempts to pull, he's just gently turned around, and so it thwarts his desired direction of travel, which then serves to cut pulling. This is a head halter. A head halter is something that is a little more power steering. It gives you more leverage, once again, changing that point of contact to underneath the dog's chin. There are a number of brands of both of these on the market, and I suggest you experiment if you decide that you would like power steering and find the brand that works best for you. At the end of this course, I'll walk you through acclimating a dog to wearing a head halter. Most dogs instantly accept anti-pull harnesses, but head halters, because they have a loop on the face, should undergo some desensitization and counter conditioning before being used. Now let's talk session length and spacing. Session length is built into this course, but it's fine to go shorter or a little longer if the dog has gas in the tank, meaning motivation. But get this, 
Research suggests we should employ much broader spacing than was traditionally taught to trainers. In the guidebook are references to a couple of studies, both of which found training once a week to be more efficient and to produce better retention than more frequent sessions. So if you're a weekend training warrior, no need to fight that tendency. There are people who are convinced their dogs won't work for food. Well, I've got news for them. Every time one of their dogs walks into the kitchen, approaches the bowl, lowers his head and takes a bite, he's working for food. Okay, on to other motivators. Aside from betting that your dog likes chicken, I'm also willing to bet that he loves walks, car rides, and going places like the park. If you have a yard, opening the door is a little paycheck. And when he's done, opening the door for him to come back in is another one. Finally, I bet there's some chance that your dog likes toys and that he likes to fetch, to tug, or both. A word about tug. Back in the Pleistocene, when I started as a young trainer, we were all cautioned to not play tug with dogs. Or if we did, we should win the game, otherwise power struggles and mayhem would ensue. Now we know that that's just not true. Research has turned up zero link between playing tug and any behavior problems, including aggression directed at you. We also know that tug, which we used to conceive of as a competition to win the toy, is actually a cooperative behavior. The origin of tug is predation. Group, hun group hunting canids, such as wolves and African wild dogs, often take down large prey, and that's a taxing and dangerous proposition. Part of how they do this is latching onto a body part and hanging on to wear the animal down. So tug is not you versus the dog. It's you and the dog versus the toy, which serves as a surrogate for prey. Choose tug toys that are big enough to give you a good grip and soft enough that there's no risk they'll damage his teeth. Okay, back to those big ticket motivators, food, door opening services, and play. I'd like you to stop always giving them away for free. That's right, I'm guessing that almost all of the time you're paying your dog without getting anything in return. Whether you're putting down his food bowl, opening the door to let him outside to play, taking him for a car ride, or a romp in the park, you're missing some opportunities. Now, you might be saying, is it such a bad thing to do something nice for my dog out of the goodness of my own heart? Not at all. But it's also important to recognize each of these motivators as a little training opportunity. Your dog is always doing something, and that something goes up in probability whenever you grant motivators. Remember, this process is among the most studied in the history of psychology. Good trainers don't leave it to chance, they leverage it. We've been talking about principle one of effective dog training. No motivation, no training. We've seen that dogs, as properly functioning living organisms, won't do something for nothing. If you fail to motivate him, you'll limp along, making up revenge and power struggle narratives. No more. Motivate your dog. Let's now move on to the next core principle we'll be using. Principle two. The dog has to feel safe. If he doesn't, nothing will make his radar except that. Like principle one, principle two is about motivation. Animals are not able to focus on puzzles, which is what training is, if there is a perceived safety emergency. Everything is kicked to the curb if there's any immediate threat to life or limb. Imagine you're in a bank and three gunmen come in and fire rounds at the ceiling and say, everybody down on the floor. Now imagine I'm lying next to you and say, psst, would you like to learn the violin? Or I make you a really attractive job offer. It's ridiculous. You're not in a state of mind to focus on this. You've got bigger fish to fry right now. It's the same with dogs. If they're afraid, they're just not going to be interested in your crummy little games to win crummy little prizes. They've got bigger fish to fry. And here's the thing, low grade fear, dogs who are a little worried or a little anxious is usually ignored. Well-meaning owners don't see it or they misdiagnose it or they dismiss it. The dog is being a drama queen. 
This is not a helpful position to take. For most of us, there is a gap between how well we think we read our dog's body language and how well we actually do. Low-grade fear is one of the most commonly missed things. It interferes with training, and as owners, we're left puzzled and frustrated. What's the matter with this dog? Ah, he's stubborn. He's got a mind of his own. He's a big mystery. Incorrect. Sometimes he's just got bigger fish to fry. I had clients once with a Tibetan Mastiff, which is a very large, fluffy breed of dog. The dog was aggressive towards unfamiliar people, great with his own family, didn't like strangers. That would be an issue for any dog, but for a large, powerful breed, it's a serious problem. Now, the owners were both university professors and had researched this breed. They had chosen very carefully and had had dogs their entire lives. They were convinced their dog was two things. One, he was overconfident and protective. And two, he was not food motivated. They concluded this because the dog looked very confident to them as he displayed at strangers they encountered. And the breed's original function was guarding people and property. At a dog class they had tried some months before, he never took food rewards. It turned out this dog found strangers scary and kept strangers from getting too close to him by aggressively displaying. Basically, he was employing offense as a defense. The dog class they, they attended was packed with strangers. When he was there, this dog had bigger fish to fry than the treats and praise they were offering him. Remember the bank with the masked gunmen? Would you feel like having a Belgian chocolate if I offered you one at that moment? Back to this dog. At home, the owner sometimes offered him dried dog cookies, which the dog usually took and buried or didn't take at all. This supported their theory. He's not very foodie. The first time I met him, he was on edge. I was a stranger. I tossed him chicken and he didn't take it. At first. Long story short, by the third appointment, this dog was crazy about my chicken. The only thing that had changed was that he was now habituated to me and no longer afraid. We treated his stranger aggression by carefully modulating how close we'd let strangers get. We paid attention to his comfort level. We taught him that on our watch, strangers were never going to get closer than he felt okay about. This meant his owners had to get better at reading the early signs that he was uncomfortable. Now, next we taught him that strangers meant chicken. Then very gradually, and always at his comfort level, we brought the strangers closer. We'll be talking in depth about classical conditioning in a future lesson. In the case of this Tibetan, he turned out to be as food motivated as any dog I've met. His unwillingness to eat was entirely due to him being afraid. And his owners, good, caring, intelligent people, missed it. So remember, before you begin training, pay close attention to your dog's perceived level of safety. If your dog doesn't feel safe, address that before doing anything else. Now, there's another thing I'd like you to notice about this case, that we progressed with the strangers in step-by-step -step fashion. And this brings us to principle three. Principle three goes like this. Training is a gradual, cumulative, step-by-step -step process. Before we start unpacking principle three, let's review principles one and two and, and an important implication. Principle one, no free lunch, gets at the economic reality of behavior having expense. No motivation, no training. Principle two, that the dog must feel safe, gets at the trumping motivation of fear and how it renders everything else irrelevant. What this means is that two-thirds of the key principles in dog training are about motivation, about why problems. But there are also what problems in dog training. The dog may have plenty of motivation and feel completely safe, but still gets the behavior wrong. This is where our third and final principle comes in. Training is a step-by-step -step process. People can struggle with this principle, and it's easy to understand why. The dog is witnessed doing exactly what the owner wants. He sits when asked. He comes when he's called. 
he refrains from jumping on people, and the owner then makes the following leap. The dog knows the behavior. Then at some later time, with good motivation on board and no fear present, the dog doesn't sit or doesn't come when called. And this is chalked up to the dog knowing what he's supposed to do, but refusing on principle. It's a power play. He's being dominant or defiant or stubborn. Some variation on the theme of insubordination. Now, a competent professional trainer looks at this and thinks, partially trained behavior. And once again, it's nothing personal. It's just an unfinished project. We administered a grade 12 quiz to a grade 6 student, and the student flunked the quiz. Think about it this way. Dogs learn sit, down, stay, and come here the way you learn the Argentine tango, not the way you learn the capital of France. It's procedural type learning. The behavior, your Argentine tango, becomes more fluent only with the accumulation of practice. You don't get fluent without lots of repetition and gradual, carefully scaled increases in level of difficulty. Trainers refer to this varying level of difficulty as criteria. It's short for criteria for reinforcement. Criteria represent your contract with the dog. What exactly does he have to do in order to be paid? Good trainers break things down so that criteria are escalated gradually. This ensures the dog will get it right often enough to keep trying. Remember, even the most motivated dog will stop trying if the game is unwinnable. So to summarize principle three, good trainers build behavior using step-by-step -step plans that increase criteria gradually. This brings us to the end of our survey of the three key principles of dog training. Let's now meet the dogs that I'll be using to demonstrate the plans and techniques in this course. First up is Lulu, a six-year-old shepherd mix. She's intense and impulsive, and I expect she'll just drink up the training. Next, we have Moxie, who is a one-year-old golden retriever. She's as sweet as she is smart. Finally, we have Nico, a two-year-old long-haired chihuahua. He'll be helping me demonstrate a few techniques specific for small dogs and dogs who need extra steps in their plans for sit and down. Your dog may get the hang of some behaviors more quickly and other behaviors more slowly than these dogs. Don't worry about it. Stick the procedures we'll be going over and let them learn at their pace.